Thank you, Ms. Patty. That was awesome. Great worship today. Great focus on the priority of life is putting God where he needs to be. You know, we're talking about a series called Am I Not a Fan? And being not a fan, a fan is an enthusiastic follower. And in our Christian world today, sometimes Christianity can be enthusiastic while we're doing something for God in a church service. But are we a follower of Christ when nobody's watching? Are we a follower of Christ when people are opposing us? You know, we can have all kinds of problems. And, you know, I, I, I like wearing a Dallas Cowboy jersey when they're 0 and 8, which is quite a few times. Because, you know what, if you're a fan, it makes no difference if people laugh at you or make fun of you because you're a fan. And some of you guys are wearing your, your Kansas City Chiefs jerseys this year with proud. Man, I'm happy I'm a Chief fan. But last year when they were 2 and, what, 14? I didn't see too many red jerseys out there. But you know what? If you're a fan, it makes no difference if people laugh at you or mock you. You're going to stand up for what you believe in. You're going to stand up for being a fan, for who you have confidence in. Are you an enthusiastic follower of a team. And you know what? We would say, yes, we all have our teams that we follow. We all have our fan base. But you know what? When that team goes 0 and 16, and people are making fun of you, you have to make a decision. Am I going to take that jersey out of my closet and I'm going to wear something else? Or will I put that jersey on with pride? You know, being an enthusiastic follower means it makes no difference what people think or what people say or what people do. What makes a difference? Are you committed to Christ? Are you committed to doing what is right? Early in Jesus' ministry, he was started, it took about three years, but he started talking and sharing and doing miracles and healing people. And his name became very popular. And people would come from all over the village to come and see and to hear and to watch. Thousands of people would watch him. And it came to a point that Jesus, when in the world's perspective, was very successful. Thousands of people. But then Jesus started asking questions. Why are you here? And they would say, because I want something, or because I like watching the miracles, or because I'm getting something from you. And at that time, Jesus decided to put the rubber on the road and say, you know what? If you are going to be a fanatic follower of me, it's going to cost you something. It's not going to be the popular thing. It's going to mean something that if you're going to be a follower of Christ, it's going to mean commitment. It's going to mean you are not going to be able to go to church on Sunday and raise your hand and be enthusiastic in a church service. It means every day of your life, I'm going to ask you to be a dedicated follower of me. And at that time, when he had thousands of people following him, and he was the rock star of the area, he said, I don't want to be the rock star. I don't want you following me because of what I can do for you. I want you to follow me because who I am. And what I have is salvation through my son and through my life. When we get to the point that we love Jesus because of what he has done, because of his forgiveness, it is not about a church service. It's not about being prideful about something that we do. It's about being dedicated and committed to Christ. This series, Not a Fan, is uh, it's a series that has been preached by many pastors uh, all over the United States. It's nothing original of mine by any means. I'm preaching somebody else's message. I wanted to share that right off the bat. But in this message, it starts off, uh, have you had the DTR talk? The DTR talk is define the relationship. And many times in early in our years when we were in college or high school, we had to have that DTR talk with, with somebody we dated or somebody that we thought we were in love with. And, and we had to say, where are we in this relationship? Am I going to only date you or can I date other people? And when you started really loving each other and talking to each other, you started saying, you know what? I don't, I, I don't want you dating anybody else. Oh, that means we're serious. 
We defined the relationship because when we both decided, I don't want to date anybody else, I want only us, we have defined the relationship. And that is in our relational aspect. I believe Jesus is telling us right now, I need you to define the relationship with me. It is not about enjoying church. It's about being committed to Christ. Many times we enjoy something, so we have become a fan of something, but we haven't given our life to something. I couldn't tell you how many times I've had people in my office and talking to me that had wayward kids. And they say something like this. We brought them up in church. They were at church when they, when they could walk, they were in church. We never missed church for anything. We were in church all the time. Now, I have a question. What did we do wrong? And I have the answer. Church isn't going to change their life. You could bring somebody up in church all day long. It doesn't change their life. Did you bring them up to love Christ? Will change their life. I see people all day long that go to church on Sunday morning, but they do not have a loving relationship with Jesus at all. Church doesn't change your life. Jesus changes your life. So when you see a fanaticism, when you see a team jersey, And you see somebody at the stadium and there's 80,000 people screaming for a a football play and somebody scored a touchdown or or a safety or or somebody kicked a field goal and thousands of people are screaming because a football team scored some points. Ah, great, wonderful. But you come into church and somebody radically gave their life to Christ that changes their eternity and we sit there and say, oh, praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Which is more important than the eternal scope of things? We need to be committed that when Christ changes our life, that we are enthusiastic followers of Christ in the world. Not on a team, not in in an NFL stadium, but in life. Now, in Luke chapter 9, here's where where Jesus is calling us. He became very popular. And then he started looking at his popularity. And he knew his popularity itself would not change people's lives. He knew what he was about ready to do was going to change their life. Luke chapter 9, well, let's start in verses 23 through 27. Now, when we're talking about commitment, now I know we're all on different roads of life, and we all have different commitment levels. Now, if you're not a follower of Christ, this is probably not going to make sense to you. And my first recommendation for you right now is to understand that Jesus loves you and that Jesus died on the cross for you and he has a way to heal your life and to give you hope in heaven. Now, your salvation in Jesus Christ is not going to give you the magic pill. And if you give your life to Christ, that means everything's going to be wonderful and you're not going to have any problems. That's not what salvation is all about. Salvation is about forgiveness and your eternal destination after death is heaven. But Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking to his followers. And he says something to you. He said, said, it's more than church. It's more than being an enthusiastic follower. It means you have to do something. And he says this in Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit if a man gains the whole world and himself destroy is lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes to his glory and his Father and his holy angels. But I tell you truly, there is something standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. In other words, he's saying, if you're ashamed of me, if you're not a fan, if you're not an enthusiastic follower of me, if you're ashamed to say my name, or if the only time you do say my name is in a negative context, he said, you don't have a relationship with me. If anybody denies me, I will deny them. And then then in Matthew chapter 7, he goes into a whole different discourse. 
In Matthew chapter 7, he brings the rubber down to the road. And I'm thinking about the stadium accesses. I'm thinking about when you try to go into the chief stadium, how, how the, the line down I-70 is like 15 miles back, and, and you have to inch your way in, and there's only a certain amount of ways that you can get into the stadium. And you're waiting in line to go to the proper gate to get into the stadium parking lot. And then you have to go into another gate to get into the stadium. It takes work to get into a stadium. It takes work. It's not just everybody has all access. And Jesus is using an illustration of a gate. And he's saying this. He said, it's tough. There's a single narrow gate. And it's not very popular to follow after me. But if you want to go through the straight and narrow gate, I'm going to give you life. But if you want to take the easy road, the broad road, it's going to be a road of destruction, but it's going to be the easy way. And if you're going to follow me, it's not going to be easy. You can play the game of ease, but if you're seriously wanting to be an enthusiastic follower of me, it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. But that's what our calling is in life. Matthew 7, 13 through 21 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction. And there will be many who go through it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Then he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are in ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by the fruits you shall know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now that's calling it black and white. That's calling it, if you want salvation through Jesus Christ, it's going to radically change your life. It's tough. It's a narrow gate. It's a gate that is very difficult to go through and the way is hard. But if you are going to allow me to transform your life, it's going to be a process and it's going to take work and it's going to be difficult, but the benefit is overwhelming. In our society today, our, Christian, our Christianese society, what we have said to the church and what we have said to everybody that believes in Christ is Jesus is going to forgive you of your sins, give your life to Christ, and everything's going to be utopia. And people buy into that because they want their churches full. So we have a packed house of full people that go to church thinking that they're safe under the blood of Jesus Christ, but they have no relationship with Christ. All they want is they want the magic pill to go to heaven, but Jesus said there is a way. There's a way, and it's narrow, and it's tough, and it's going to take work, and it's not going to be easy. Now, you can buy into the lie of the false prophets, and it's going to be, that's going to come to you in sheep's clothing, and it's going to tell you all kinds of good things, and you can believe that lie, but the end result of that is death. What is salvation? Salvation is simply, I have to accept that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I'm going to dedicate, commit my life, not Sunday. I'm going to commit my life to be a follower of Jesus. That means I have to do things that I don't want to do. I have to give up things I don't want to give up. But in order to follow Christ, that's what he says we must do. Now, Here's the illustrations that he gives to us. In Luke chapter 9, down the verses, there's, there's about three or four verses that, that really define what he's talking about. He's talking to a group of people and he's trying to make a decision whether, he's going to, whether they are going to follow him because of what that they can get or are they going to follow him because who he is and what he's going to do. Churches cannot, pastors cannot, and members cannot come to church because of what they can get. We come to church because who we represent. And we have to be a total fanatic for what Jesus Christ has done for you and what he's done for me. What he has done is more important than any ball game. What he has done is more important than anything a college or an NFL team could ever possibly do. You know what? That Dallas Cowboy team that I like so much, at the end of the season, guess what I get out of them? 
Nada. I don't get anything from them. I may get a little bit of a few hours of watching entertainment and get enthusiastic about my team winning or my fantasy team winning. But at the end of the day, I don't get anything out of a team. At the end of the day, I'm wearing a jersey. At the end of the day, I've enjoyed watching a game. But when it comes to Jesus, at the end of the day, I get something. I get somebody that's going to absolutely change my life. I get something, my sins are forgiven. I have been redeemed. I know that my sins are not accounted to me because Jesus died on the cross for me. I can be a fanatic for the cause of Jesus Christ because of what he has done for me. At the end of the day, in our world, we don't get much out of that. We don't get much out of a football team, basketball team. Oh, it's entertainment, but it doesn't change our life. So here are three things that he says. In Luke chapter 9, let's start with 57 through 62. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you. Where are you going? And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He's saying, if you're going to be committed to me, it's not going to be comfortable. If you're going to be committed to me, and you're going to follow me, I don't have a place to stay. Jesus is calling them out. If you're going to follow me, get out of your comfort zone. If you're going to follow me, I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to be radical. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, prepare yourself because it's not going to be easy. And sometimes we get into the comfort zone of our life. And Jesus, if he radically changed your life, if he gave you salvation, if your life has been redeemed, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost your dedication, your love. It's going to cost your influence. It's going to say, I am going to follow you at all costs. This guy said, I will follow you. And Jesus says, listen, if you say that, that's great. But let me tell you, I want to put out the conditions in front. If you follow me, it's not going to be comfortable. So if we decide that we're going to be committed to Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you right up front, it's not going to be comfortable. There's going to be times that people will laugh at you. It'll be times that people will mock you. It'll be times that it's going to be financially frustrating to you because you are going to give sacrificially to the church so you can do certain things, so people can see Christ. It's not going to be comfortable. But you know what? If we're dedicated, if we're committed, it's not about comfort. It's about salvation and what he has done to us and for us. Committed or comfortable? I guess that would be the question. And then in verse 59 he says, Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, for you go preach for the kingdom of God. Now he's not saying, in context, the guy's dad is not dead. He's saying, wait till my mom and dad die. Let me get their inheritance so I will have resources so I can live on my own and I can be comfortable and then I will follow you. Then I'll have resources. Then I don't have to worry about anything. I don't care what my mom and dad think or my family thinks. I can do my own life after they die. And Jesus is saying this. He said, huh. It's not about doing it later. If you follow me, follow me. You know, we had a missionary to Morocco. 98.8% of that country is, is Islamic, which means it's illegal to convert to Christianity. Jesus, in Morocco, hypothetically, somebody comes up to him and says, I want to follow you, but let my mom and dad die first. Because I don't want to be excommunicated from the house. I don't want to not get the inheritance. Jesus is saying to this guy, he's saying, if you love me, if you want to follow me, do it. Don't let the others influence you whether I will follow or I won't follow. It's either you will or you won't. Don't let others influence you. Is it your decision? I love when we're talking about uh, going to NFL games. You know, what, you know what a true definition of a fan is? 
is when you're in the Kansas City Chiefs Arrowhead Stadium that has the loudest stadium in the world. Right, all right, all right. And you wear a Dallas Cowboy jersey in. Okay, now, now you are a fan because they're throwing junk at you, they're yelling at you, they're making all kinds of things. Why? It's because they hate another team. Now, they don't really hate you. They're representing the team that you are wearing. And in our fanaticism, if we are wearing a jersey that says Jesus across the back of it, and we're into a world that hates Jesus, what are they going to do? They're going to mock you. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to play with you. They're going to try to embarrass you. Are you willing to be a committed follower of Christ in a world that does not like him? If you are, then that is an enthusiastic follower of Christ. It's not blending in. It is standing out is important. And then verse 61 he says, and another said also, Lord, I will follow you, but let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. He said, if you just say later, you won't ever do it. If Jesus is calling you, if Jesus is calling you to Christianity, if the Holy Spirit is calling you to ministry, is calling you to service, and you're saying to your heart, as this guy did, I will later. Not because of influence, not because of my family. I just want to, I just want to say goodbyes to everybody. I just want to make sure I have enough time to do what I want to do. And Jesus, in three and a half years, changed the world. And he's saying to us, now's the time. You can't know the truth and not be impacted by the truth. It's either we accept what God has called us to do or we are not. We are not called to be a church on Sunday morning. We are called to be a church that impacts a world seven days a week. When a church is satisfied with Sunday morning, enthusiastic worship service, a wonderful sermon, and to walk out those doors and to come back next Sunday, we are being an enthusiastic fan of church. Church doesn't change our lives. When we are alone, hurting, we get the phone call, when somebody's dead, when somebody that we love is gone, when somebody's going through a divorce, when they're having financial ruin and chaos is happening, the church can't save you. Only Jesus can. And when you fall on your face before God and he's the only person that you know that can rescue, then you become a radical follower of Christ. The church loves you, but the church can't save you. There's a lot of people that believe in church, but church is a place that we come to in the church building that we worship in, but the body of Christ, a group of people come together as the church, but the church can't save you. Only Jesus because of what he did on the cross, can transform your life. And when you're struggling, when you're hurting, when issues are taking place, you have to go on your knees before God and let the Savior of the world that loves you unconditionally take you and redeem you and help you. And when you have done that, when you've been struggled, when you have been broken, and when you're hurting, and you fall on your face before God and say, Lord, I need you, and he comes up beside you and he uses the people around you to influence you, to help you, to guide you through it. And then when you stand up, you, oh, you may see people that walk beside you. You may see people that helped you in time of need. But do you know who really helped you? It was Jesus instigating those divine moments of your life to bring people alongside you at that exact moment that can lift you up, that can help you, that can minister to you, that can get you through those issues. It's still about Jesus. And he said, you can't wait till later. I don't want to go later. I need you to go now. If you're going to follow me, do it. Do it now. Do it with all your heart. So let me give you the three points. The first, why are you here? He asked the crowd, why are you here? And I asked you that same question. The thousands of people and on the mountain as Jesus was talking. He simply said, why are you here? And many of them said, because of 
the miracles and because of the feeding, because of the show. And Jesus told them, it's not about the show. It's not about the feeding. It's not about what I can get, you can get out of me. It's are you going to be a radical follower of me? Why are you here? And at this point, the Bible says, I think it's in verse 60 of Luke chapter 9, that many of his disciples left and went home. Many of his disciples left and went home. Because it was defined at that moment, Christianity is not about the show. Christianity is about a commitment that you have to Christ. And sometimes it's going to take a sacrifice in order to get what you need. And that sacrifice is the intimacy between you and God. He says, why are you here? And then he says, are you all in? He asks, are you all in? When, when you say, are you all in, I mean, it means, are you willing to risk it all? Are you willing to risk, you know, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I, watch, I like watching Texas Hold'em, right? Anybody ever watch Texas uh, I'm the only person who watches Texas Come on, raise your hand if you've ever watched Texas Hold'em. Okay, there's five truthful men in here, okay? Anyway, there's a term in Texas Hold'em when they push all in, okay? They're saying, my hand is good enough, I'm going to risk all my resources to go all in to beat you. So they push it all in. And Jesus is saying, in our life, are you all in? Now, what is the context? Jesus is not a way to salvation. Jesus is the way to salvation. In Christianity, in the early form, it is a new religion. It's a new movement. And when they followed Christ, they are saying, I have confidence that Jesus is going to radically change the world, and that is my hope. We today, we have so many different religions and so many different doctrines and, and different perspectives of things that we sometimes think, if this Christianity thing doesn't work out, I still have this, or I still have another, or I have hope that I'll do more good than I'll do bad, and if I do more good than do bad, my good will outweigh my bad, and I'll go to heaven. You know what? That's a lie of Satan. There's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus. And the question is, are you all in? Do you have your faith in Christ and Christ alone? And then the last one is, have you made it your own? Have you made it your own? You know, sometimes we become fans. I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to use the Ludwigs. I don't know why I'm going to use the Ludwigs, but they're easy to use and play with, so I'm going to use them. Fred Ludwig is a Boston Red Sox fan, right? Would you agree with that? Fred grew up being a Boston Red Sox fan. He loves the Boston Red Sox. Guess what all of his kids watch? The Boston Red Sox. They watch the Boston Red Sox because that's what they grew up watching, the Boston Red Sox. And now they love the Boston Red Sox because that's all they have loved in their life. My question is, are they truly... Boston Red Sox fans, or are they Fred Ludwig fans? Honestly. Because if they are not truly Boston Red Sox fans, they may fall in love with something that their dad loved, but they don't truly know. Christianity is exactly the same thing. Many times we have grown up in church, and because my dad and my mom grew up in church, I have gone to church. I have grown up in church. I like church. I like the youth department. I like the music. I like church. But it's not mine. Jesus has never really been mine. I come because mom or because dad or because I like it. But I'm truly not a fan of Jesus. Until we have a commitment to Jesus personally. Until we know without a doubt it is mine. Until I know when chaos takes place that I still love Jesus. I'm not coming to church for mom or for dad or for the preacher or for anyone. I come to church because I want to have a relationship with Jesus. And it's my relationship. And it's not with nobody else. Can we know without a doubt that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. 
Because until we get to the point that we go through that narrow road, we're staying on this broad way of convenience and comfort. We're playing the game. We enjoy life. But we do not have the intimacy with Christ. So what happens? It happens in every church that I've ever been to is we play the game of convenience. If I like church, if I like the music, if the preacher preaches a good sermon, if it's comfortable, if they can meet my needs, I'll go to their church. Folks, this church cannot meet any of your needs. The thing that I have to do is I have to proclaim the name of Jesus. I have to lift up the name of Christ. And when Christ radically changes your life, you'll realize it's not about what the church can do for you. It's how we together can change people's lives for the kingdom of God. And when we get that in our hearts and in our lives, we become enthusiastic, radical, committed followers of Christ. This month, the entire month, we're doing a series, Not a Fan. I don't want us to be a church of just being a fan. I want to be a church that's committed, that's radical, that understands I am going to make a commitment not to play the game of church. That I want to change people's lives by giving them something that's more important than church. It's Jesus. The Bible says that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus. It boils down. There's no other name that's going to get you into heaven other than Jesus. Have you given your life to Christ? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? I want to ask you this. Before you leave today, before you can start on the journey of being a committed follower of Christ, you have to make that decision. Is Jesus something genuinely real within your life? Is he yours? Have you pushed all in? Or are you playing the annies? Are you playing the simple bets? Are you playing the game? Or are you all in for Christ? Because I believe until we decide that he is all I need. We will do whatever we can to be satisfied spiritually. But Jesus will never radically change our hearts and our lives until we get to the point, and we all have to be there, that you know what? It's not about anything else other than I'm putting my hope, my confidence, and my future in Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we ask you over these next few minutes, as we sing a song of commitment to you. That Lord, some of us need to have a touch from you. Some of us need to have a relationship with you. Some of us need to get deeper and move into a committed stage instead of just an enthusiastic enjoyment stage of life. But Lord, I want us, I want you to change us. I want us, as a body of Christ, to walk out these doors, a people that will say, I am willing to be committed. I am willing to do what you called me to do. Lord, it's not going to be easy. You told us in Matthew chapter 7, it's going to be difficult. And few will go through this gate. Many will find the other gate because it's the easy way to go. But Lord, Give us the desire. Give us that boldness. Give us the strength to stand, to go through that narrow, simple gate. It's tough. We need your help. So please give us that strength today. And Lord, during this invitation, I ask you right now to walk through the hearts of every person in here and to tug on that heart and to make sure that person has a relationship with you. A relationship that they understand that they cannot go to heaven without you. Their sins cannot be forgiven without you. And they know right now that they need to be dedicated to you for their salvation 
and for their future. Lord, give us that hope today. We need that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. There's nobody grandfathered into heaven. Every person has to accept Jesus Christ because sin separates us from God. But the Bible says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has a gift, the gift of salvation. If you understand that you're a sinner and you can't go to heaven without you, Jesus died on the cross for you. He has offered that gift to you. And if he wants to give that gift to you, and if you accept that gift of salvation, then he is going to start doing something radical within your life. He is going to change everything about the way you see life. Please, please make Jesus the Lord of your life. Will you please stand to your feet? We're going to sing the song of invitation, an opportunity for you. If the Lord is talking to you, if you're struggling with things within your life, if you don't know Christ as your Lord, we would like to give you that opportunity today. There'll be people down here praying for you. I'll be praying for you and with you. If you have things that you need to give up to Him, if Christianity has been simple, it's been easy, let's give Jesus the priority within our life. It may be difficult, but there's nothing in life easy that's worth living. Everything is difficult. Everything takes a priority. And sometimes we make our Christianity so simple. It's so simple. It's not worth anything that we have because we don't have a commitment to it. Christianity is deeper, much deeper than just coming to church. It is being a committed follower of Christ. Will you make that decision? You need to make that decision. And so do I. Let's sing this song.